Shalom, and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamet in Highland Park, New Jersey, the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shemet. And joining me are my good friends, Rabbi Barry Chesler and Solomon Schechter Day School of Long Island and Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanowski and Anshay Chesed in New York City. We are recording this during the Aseret Yimei Tshuva. This today is day 369 of the war, um, which, which in itself is uh, just overwhelming to think about. We'll talk about that in a second, but first... Gemar Chatima Tova to all of our viewers and and listeners. Uh, wishing everyone uh, during this week of Tshuva, Seret Yimei Tshuva, uh, a, um, an easy fast, a meaningful Yom Kippur, as we're going to talk about that, and entering Yom Kippur this, this year under these circumstances. You know, yesterday um, uh, there were big commemorations. There was, I spent a lot of time Watching the um, the ceremony from Israel, the the stream of the ceremony of the the the, the one year uh, anniversary of October the seventh, because that's the the date on the on the secular calendar. Um, this whole question of ex, of which date to commemorate it it's almost irrelevant at this point because October the seventh has become the symbolic date. Um, but but it's it's hard to enter the the mood of Yom Kippur this year, uh, given that the anniversary is taking place, or took place in this week. And, and just as we begin, you know, Yom Kippur starts with Kol Nidre. And, um, you know, there's a line in Kol Nidre which says, Mi Yom Kippurim ze ad Yom Kippurim haba aleinu litova. And, you know, you have to stop and, and um, linger on that. From this Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur. Now, in the context of, Yom, of Kol Nidre, you're annulling vows. It kind of doesn't make sense what we're saying. We're, we're saying that anything that we promise, you know, for the future, uh, we, we hereby nullify. It may be, in fact, a reference to unfulfilled vows of last year. But forget the vows for a second. It's, it's really thinking about a year. And at last Yom Kippur, to this Yom Kippur, and thinking about this Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur, and and of course none of us would have ever thought uh, that the world would have changed for us from last Kippur to this Yom Kippur. Last Yom Kippur, we were busy, you know, thinking about well, it's fifty years since the Yom Kippur War. Um, there was a lot of reflection on that, and then uh, October the seventh happened, and that basically knocked the 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 kishkas out of everybody um no more thinking about the past but thinking about really you know hours before us and the days ahead and the weeks ahead and and all of that um i wonder as we we read that verse you know miyom kipurim ze ad yom kipurim haba aleinu letovav concealed in that is the you know this sense that you know Let's pray, God, that that uh, that this world will be much different from from what it is right now. I don't know if you have a reflection on that. I'm just going to pitch that out as the the opening pitch for for our conversation here. So I, I would say that brings up for me, you know, an, an interesting dynamic about Yom Kippur, uh, and I spoke about this not on Rosh Hashanah, but during the month of Elul, I had a you know an evening class one time about this uh, this year. Are you trying in the period of tshuva and in this high holiday period to change the future or are you trying to change the past? Okay. And I think what you said was, is really quite, you know, quite on point. It doesn't make any sense or it doesn't really seem to make moral sense, you know, in Kol Nidre to say, I hereby renounce anything that I will promise to do. And I, and I kind of suspect that it hasn't always redounded to the credit of the Jewish people that we start off the holiest day of this year saying, if I tell you something, don't believe it. <laughs> but, I, but it I have to disagree sense. with you there. <laughs> it does make more sense to say, you know, as, as you said, I think this is correct. It's, it's a mitzvah from the Torah. It's a mitzvah to your rights. It's a failure, fulfill your vows. If you fail to fulfill your vows, you, you begin with that harata, it haratna bahon. I'm sorry that I, that I re, you know, I regret those Explain things. Explain a regret. Yeah, harata. I regret. I regret. Um, and so there's a lot of ways in which the high holidays are trying to trying to turn towards the future. And I do think that there is something like 
spiritually wise about saying, um, uh, 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 you know, like don't lacerate yourself about the past. You can't whip yourself up. You can't beat yourself up about the past. Try to be better in the future. I got it. But there's an amazing teaching in Tractate Yoma that is very well known and very beloved among us, us of the rabbinic class, that I think is really deep. And, and I, this is what I talked about in my class this year, um, that anybody who makes tshuva out of ahava, you repent out of just love, your willful sins of the past get turned into merits. What? You get turned into merits? It becomes a mitzvah that you did that sin in the past? And I think the idea is something like the past is never over because you still have to rewrite the story of your life. The past is never really closed because it becomes knit into a story about how you're going to live. In other words, you still have to deal with your past. You can't put your past in your rearview mirror. You have to deal with your past. And if you deal with it in a productive way, if the if the regret, if the heartbreak, if the reevaluation of who you want to be changes, then those steps where you got lost before, they suddenly add up to a different story about who you are. And so I I I, I kind of get why the prayer book turned from an expression of regret about the past to a to a you know forward-looking uh, view. But I, I like the idea that my past stuff doesn't evaporate. It's still in my, still in the pocket on my back and I still have to deal with it. Well, I would go a step further. Not only do you have to deal with it, it can still be redeemed. And I think that, you know, one of the huge ironies of Yom Kippur, especially as we get older, is that we keep coming back. Haven't we learned any lessons in our life? Why are we still repenting for the same sins that we did, in my case, over 50 years ago, some of them. And I think the reason why Kol Nidre is cast the way it is, is actually an attempt to be redemptive, that we're telling ourselves we're going to be here next year. And we're going to have the same issues or many of the same issues. But this year, I can change. And if I can't, I have the security of next Yom Kippur to come back to. And I would connect it with my favorite prayer for the high holidays, which is Unitana Tokev. And I think a lot of times we focus on the beginning part, who's going to die by this and who's going to die by that. And we kind of lose sight of the punchline, which is Uchuva, Tfila, Tstaka, Mavirina, Ruach, Zera, that repentance, uh, prayer, and charity, as our colleague Rabbi Eliezer Diamond put it, postpone the evil decree, right? We can only put our death off for another year at the most, because one day we're going to be called home. And I think that the idea is that even though life seems like it may be written in stone, which is the way sometimes we imagine the book of life, it actually is written with a lot of room for change. And that our role is to change it. You know, last week I spoke about Chuvaz coming home. And I think that this model of Chuvat Filat Staka are three different ways of being at home. We want to be at home with God. We want to through Chuva. We want to be at home with ourselves through prayer. And we most especially want to be home in the world, which we do by Staka. Well, let me let me ask you this question, just because you made reference to the deep past. And and this line in Kol Nidre refers to, you know what's coming in the future. And of course, we also think about things that we have uh, promised that we did not fulfill. I think, you know, what goes through our minds is that that we're nullifying those things that we didn't fulfill. Um, but the question I have is, is, is Yom Kippur only visiting or revisiting the last year or are there the scars that we have from from years ago? You you said fifty years ago. That that would be um, quite a long time. But but the truth is that uh, I think we all carry as you know we get older. We certainly you know we certainly carry things from from earlier parts of our lives. The extent to which we you know th these things pulsate in our lives. These you know uh, sins, mistakes, you know flaws decisions etc uh that we may have healed from or atoned for or you know sought forgiveness to what extent they they are now you know re re unsealed and then revisited and then resealed um 
to what extent are we revisiting our own selves? I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about sermons and thinking about what to prepare and what to talk about and thinking like, you know, do many of us change from year to year? Do 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 we really learn? I have a whole list of things that I want to improve on. You know, if I go to this list, I go like, eh, don't, you're still the same. You're you're still pretty much the same. <laughs> you know, it's it's yes and yes. I mean, like uh, yes, yes, because it seems to me that there are, and and it's it's tied actually to what you, how you define a sin, like. I'm an, let, let's say a person says, you know, I'm an impatient person. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of easily angered. Or somebody says, you know, I'm really not that generous. I, I just, I find it hard to, to give stuff away. Those are like personality defects that we'll always be working on. And then there's behaviors and deeds. Like I stole that money and either I, I didn't pay it back, which in case... That, then it's still hanging over you or listen I, I paid it back but i'm just really still so upset about that there's a way in which if you repeat it you know the, the personality defect part that's always with you that's who you are you can't just decide you just can't decide in chuba that you're that you're no longer you're gonna you're no longer gonna be impatient or you're no longer gonna be ungenerous you have to work on those things and you hopefully you'll build those capacities but if you keep beating yourself up on you know, a bad act, there's a way in which it's actually a little bit mean to God. Um, it, it's a little bit insulting to God to say, I don't think that you can be no say a bone for me. I don't think that you forgive me because I don't forgive myself. And and so maybe here a little bit of imitatio day, a little bit of for behaviors, you should probably think God forgave you. For character traits, you still got work to do. Yeah. Yeah, so I I like very much what you said, Jeremy. I think that what I think I've come to realize is that we don't really change all that much along the lines that Jeremy described, but we can always still be better people. And I think that what Yom Kippur is supposed to force us to recognize is that we need to have a certain level of comfort with ourselves, with all of our failings. We repeat the al and the Ashamnu over and over and over again because we are sinners and we belong to a sinning people. And as bad as that is, it's not the worst. That there is, at the end of the day, hope. And the hope requires our full attention. So we devote a whole day to nurturing that hope on Yom Kippur with the hope again or expectation that it can carry us through the year as the last year has reminded us we don't know what kind of year it's going to be sure. and you know the other thing i wanted to say earlier that what we often miss about kol nidre is what really makes kol nidre is not the words which most of us don't understand but the melody that people respond to that melody which I think people who take Yom Kippur seriously understand that that really is the essence of the day, just hearing that chant. Yeah, no, definitely. The the, the melody conveys all the, the emotion, the longing, the loss, the the sense of mystery, and, and so much more. Because, uh, because religion works on us in so many different ways. It works on us, you know, it works on us on the cognitive level. It's like you talk about an idea and you have a, you know, a text and the Rambam and the Talmud and and it works on the level of, you know, sensory stuff. Food is culture. Like, you know, I, I, I'm i sure you know that feeling of the early spring and you come in with the parsley and the taste of the horseradish and it's just Passover. And that melody, it just takes you into zones of like deep Jewish, you know, memory baked into the genes. But I want to say one thing more about the personality trait. There, there was a very well-known... Uh, Israeli national religious rabbi Rav Shagar, Rav Shimon Gershon Rosenberg, who's famous for a lot of things. He was he he is a character in his friend Chaim Sabato's book about the Golan Heights fighting in seventy three, um, badly burned in a tank. And he and Chaim Sabato comes up and and he really he really is a person of light. And Rav Shagar is a scarred, literally scarred 
and emotionally scarred person. And he has an essay in which he talks about tshuva as self-acceptance. There's so much of that you can't control, but you can control your reaction. You know, there's so much you can't control in your life. You're, you're, you, anybody, you know, who's whatever, tried to quit smoking or tried to lose weight or any of those things, they're not so easy. You can't just decide to do them. Um, and one element in tshuva, he said, is reconciling yourself to the things that you can't just change. And and some measure of self -accept acceptance and seeing your seeing yourself from God's eyes, you know, and still being able to, you know, God loves us all, and uh, even if we're even if we're impatient and ungenerous, and um, and so some some measure of self acceptance is part of this process too. So I want to I want to switch gears now and and talk about forgiveness and talk about mechila, and and you know present um, this this issue. Uh, certainly with the hostages and and I think you know given the fact that that we're in such a crisis moment and you know I, I said to my shul on on Rosh Hashanah that there's really only one thing to pray for here you know of course there's lots to pray for but the one thing that's parked right in is you know we don't think we can go on without without them coming back in some way um and and I was deeply um, shaken, as everyone was, uh, after the murder of the six hostages, during which, uh, in, the, in the, the hours and days afterwards, you know, people from President Herzog to the families, to the parents, uh, they all, and, and people, you know, in general said slicha. They were saying a public apology. Herzog, you know, gave a, um, a, a speech saying how deeply, deeply sorry he was. And he was addressing the dead hostages, as Israelis do in their eulogies. They talk in the second person. It's something that we tend not to do in in, in America, North America. We, we we tend more to the third person in our eulogies. I, I, that, that may be changing, by the way. Uh, and that may be where the conversation itself. But um, he was addressing to the, the hostages in the second person and saying, slicha, slicha, you know, we you know forgive us. We we let you down, and in you know in Jerusalem, there are posters of Hirsch Goldberg Poland all over the place, every single place in Jerusalem, and apparently you know afterwards, not apparently, but but you know after his death, his murder, you know people graffiti were were our people were were just writing slicha on the poster, you know, and saying sorry, and. I wonder a how effective that is. B what what that's about, and C you know to what extent is forgiveness and apology um, the 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 necessary step to enter into a new year? You need to, uh, let's talk about how much we need that and and how you relate to that and just give your reactions to to that. I, I my reaction was you know. How how are they? How are the victims supposed to forgive if they're no longer alive? And and then of course you know that it's a, it's rhetoric, but the rhetorical power of it, you know, can it commands our attention? And and what is it that you know? I'm I'm asking for your therapeutic advice. What 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 am I dealing with here? <laughs> yes. How do you feel about that? How do I feel about that? What is your what? Are, do you have any memories about your mother that relate to this? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no. no. I, uh, from my distant vantage point, and I was in Israel in June, um, saw all of those posters, and they had not, blessedly, not yet been, been written slicha, and, and I find myself, you know, certainly on the side of, and the protests that I've been to here, and I find myself you know, connected with the the Matei Mishpachot, the Families Forum in Israel, who say, you know, uh, seal the deal, make the deal. Iska Achshav, there was a sign that was in the Tel Aviv protest, which I thought was right on point. Iska Achshav, the deal now, Ogzar Din Mavet, or a death sentence. That's your choice. And and I do feel, not that I think that Yahya Sinwar, you know, was like gunning for a deal either. So it's, it's not like 100% on the Israeli government or something, but Israeli government chose 
to prioritize prosecuting the war to a, to a fuller extent than to taking his foot off the gas paddle and making uh, making a deal. And and I have my view about that. Other people have their views. And it seems like Israel is quite divided about whether that was the wise and necessary route because you can't make a deal with people like this and you can't trust them and you can't take your foot off this gas pedal until Hamas is eradicated. And the people who say, well, listen, we've, we've done a good amount of damage now and, and it, we can stop now and make and make a deal and bring people home, which is where I find myself. But my point is that the slicha on the posters is written by the people in the second camp. And I think they at least partly want to make the people in the first camp say, you should be ashamed of yourself and you should seek, you should live a kesh slicha. Um, and and you should you should you should beg apology, and I I feel like that's what it sounds to me like the distant, you know my 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 very emotional connection, but I'm not there and I don't know and I and I only speak to the kinds of people that I speak to. Um, so I and again it seems, it seems like there's maybe, a real maybe I'm asking a, a more theoretical question, which is okay. So so apologies, you know they're written on the the poster, but but take it down a step, which is. You know, can you can you start a year without it? Can and 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 here I, again, I'm looking at Yom Kippur globally as a, you know, the day of atonement, the day in which you know, well, you know, just to finish that, the the Kol Nidre service. So it says, "Vinislach lechol adat bnei Israel." You know, we're quoting these biblical verses. You know, "Vayomer Hashem salach di kidvarecha." So there's a certain, you know, there's a certain lightness that comes from from knowing that you're forgiven. And so I think I think what's happening, you know, with in in this in this tremendous and anguishing drama is we're 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 looking to express apology for the sake that we think we have let you down, even though we know you can never forgive us because you're not alive, and therefore we have to live with that. And and I don't know how we live with that, but we have to kind of. We we have to be able to find a way to go on from this so, catastrophe. What I would say is that, as our teacher Rabbi Baruch Boxer pointed out, when he uh, developed the illness that took his life, that we can't always choose the events that happen to us, but we can choose our response. And the response on our part is to ask for forgiveness. And what happens, I think, is that the, the murder of the six hostages was crushing. It wasn't only that lives were crushed. It also took something from those that are still alive as well. And when that happens, we have a need to do something or to express something. And the, the way we do that, I think, religiously is to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this did not work out. It did not work out for you, and it did not work out for me, and I will bear that burden. But you're talking a little b before about forgiveness, and my experience has been over my my life that it's much easier to be forgiven than to forgive. And what's striking in the verse that you co quoted is that God forgives. He is not forgiven. And we want to be like God on Yom Kippur by forgiving and let other people worry about whether we will be forgiven. I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 mean, I, I think that we, the active thing is to forgive, but that's what we have the most difficult with, difficulty with. We want to be forgiven. There's no question about that. When we do something wrong, we say, I'm sorry, and we expect to, the immediate response often to be, oh, that's okay. But when someone does something to us and they say, I'm sorry, we, our tendency is to say, I don't believe you. You know, it's got to work both ways. If we yeah. want to be forgiven, we have to forgive. So I, the, I, I'm beautiful, yeah. and I think that's totally on point. I, I said this on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, you know, Avina Malkin of Kodvena Besefer Slichao Michila, you know, our father, our king, right, inscribe us in the book of forgiveness. Uh, you have to inscribe. You, you might be you might be inscribed on the side of the person who receives forgiveness. You have to inscribe yourself on the book of forgiveness because you gave it. I, I for a second there, I thought you were saying, and maybe you were. We we need to forgive God, and that that you know God is forgiving us. Um, 
You know, I'm, I'm reminded of that beautiful Yiddish proverb that if God lived on earth, all his windows would be broken, you know. <laughs> and, you know, people do have, you know, their tangled up relationships with God because they feel that life has been unfair to them. Mm -hmm. And and um, and that that sometimes the burdens of of that unfair life uh, are are quite anguishing as as you know the families of the hostages and all, and all and the people who have lost loved ones are are experiencing there 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 are people who are able to say hareni mikabel et gzerat cha be'ava i accept your decree on my life i accept the decree we, we you know i accept what has happened with love um it's it's not easy to say that, but but that's where we we want to get to that place of acceptance. And there are some people that say, oh, "I'll never be able to accept this. Never be able to reconcile my relationship with God, given given you know the the unfairness that I've had to endure in life." That's what people say. So so are you saying, or should we say, or can we say, um, you know, God forgives us? Uh, maybe we need to. And is it audacious to say? Is it arrogant to say? You know, that God is asking us to. <laughs> there is a tradition where God, we we forgive God as well, rooted in Hasidism. I've been reading a lot of stories from the late Elie Wiesel, who yeah. wrote a number of books about biblical characters, rabbis, and Hasidic masters. And there is that sense that. God needs to be forgiven too, but that's not the direction I was going. The verse that you quoted was Salachti Kidvarecha. Yes. I forgive you as you have your request or according yes. to your word. And the power in that is that God forgives. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us to forgive, not incumbent upon us to be forgiven, but to actually forgive, which you is forgive. much harder to do. Right. right. You know, God often takes the harder role. And ask us to live up to him. Let me ask you this question, which is, which is, have you ever um, apologized and not been forgiven? Um, in 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 the course of the, the rabbinate, uh, I've had experiences where you know things have gone awry, and and uh, I, I've tried my apologies with people, and um, I've I've been disappointed in in. The reciprocity of this. Well, the lack of reciprocity. The lack, the <laughs> lack of reciprocity, and I feel you know there there is there is a command. There is a halacha that if someone asks you for someone apologizes to you, you have to accept the apology by the third time. By if the they, third time, if you are convinced that they are genuine, if you're convinced that they're genuine, right. okay. it's right. And there's a lot of fudge factor in it but it also is a recognition that some people find it very hard to forgive yeah but again i come back to this idea that if we want to be forgiven we have to forgive and i think the reason why we want to be forgiven is because that's how we find some peace in our own lives the, the, and in order to find peace in our lives we have to enable other people to find peace in their lives that, that's, right. the, so, that's the good way of saying it the, the Christian thinker C.S. Lewis has a great line. He says, for the most part, uh, you know, for, for other people, we have a very high standard. This is the point you're making, but he he, he makes it in, in a snarkier way than you are now. He says, for, for most people, we have a very high standard. That it's, what they've done is just really unjustifiable and unforgivable. And what we want for ourselves is not really forgiveness, but an excuse. Like, well, actually, we didn't do anything wrong to begin with. But really entering in this process takes us down from both of those extreme and unhelpful ledges, edge, ledges that the that the person who, who I think did something bad to me, it's, it's just that you can't forgive that. And the person that I did, listen, what I did, I, anybody would have done the same what I did. And let's meet in the middle and say, we hurt each other. We, you know, we hurt each other some. We're mean to each other some. We're at our worst. And we're going to forgive each other and go on. Right. So so in that sense, forgiveness is a tremendous gift and it's a tremendous, there's a tremendous vulnerability. I think that the, the tradition really is understanding of the fact that when you when you apologize, you're making yourself open to another person. And and that by doing so, the you have tremendous vulnerability, and that the person 
receiving the apology can't take advantage of that 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 there is a power relationship the you are you have less power when you make yourself vulnerable and the person who has to forgive has all the power and their withholding of forgiveness is the is a, is an inappropriate use of their power <laughs> and it's a rectification of the power imbalance that happened in the sin because when i stole your bicycle yes. you were rendered powerless and i was powerful yeah and even if i've already paid you back you know given you back your bicycle or paid you the fee of your bicycle the relational quality was still about one person was was powerful and disempowered and in some you know whatever way i don't want to get all you know i'm going to say dis you know dehumanized it's not it's not the worst thing it ever was um but at some small level you you said to to your friend you can't even stop me from stealing your bicycle and oh. and until you can so when you make yourself vulnerable you give that person the power back that you stole i often think that the yisker on yom kippur is about making amends with with the dead in other words we're remembering them but we're also in some ways seeking forgiveness which kind of brings me back to the murdered hostages which is well we'll never get you know we'll never have a communication from them you know with in sorrow um but we we all we always want to live in the in a, in a, in, a, in a space where we are going to amend our you know correct ourselves for the sense of letting them down and i think that when we do mechila to people who are no longer alive when we ask forgiveness from people who are no longer alive in a sense we we're trying to to literally correct ourselves um and and to and to uh, repair the relationship that we have with the memory, the, our memory of them. Am I? I don't know if you if you're, you know, connected or how would you connect to that a uh, theme of memory and the dead or do you, on Yom Kippur? Is that? No, I got two. Oh, Yisker, as the name implies, is all about memory. It is. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting that Yisker apparently originated with Yom Kippur. And then migrated to the Shalosh Galim. That's right. That's right. Because the power of memory is so strong. And I thought when I was a pulpit rabbi that the last memory we want of the holiday is the holidays of yesteryear with those people who are no longer there. Mm -hmm. And we want to recall them because that's what makes the holiday. I think of the, I, I have, I call them the upstairs shul. <laughs> And, and you don't need the women's it, balcony. It's no, it's, it's like I, I feel, you know, in this kind of sentimental way, but but very much, you know, we, when we say Utsuror Bitsura Chaim, you're you're bound to us in the bond of life, that by the fact that we have a, a, a living congregation who's longing for and remembering, you know, the those people, they are bound, they're still bound up in the bonds of life with us. Um, and that's possibly a good way to 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 bring our conversation to a conclusion. Because we're all about, you know, praying for life at this point, uh, life for our each other and and for communities for Kal Yisrael. Jeremy. And so, by the way, Barry, so let me just add add to that praying for life, and we all know how to say to life. So, in at least one of those versions of uh, of that that thing about we and God for you know forgiving each other, um, the story is you know he goes to the Rav Eli Melech sends sends the chassid to go to see so and so, and and the guy makes his his confession. He, he over overhears him. He's not he's not going to talk to him. He goes to his house to overhear him, and uh, and he hears, oh, "I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've done this." But to tell you the truth, Rabbi Shalom, you haven't been so nice to me either, because this happened to me and that happened to me and this happened to me and that happened to me. Tell you what, let's let's call it even and have a lechayim. Yeah. <laughs> Very well said. I like that. Very nice. So, l'chaim to everybody. Ketiva v'chatima tova. May you all be written and inscribed and sealed for a good year. May we all be able to say l'chaim together. We pray again for the remaining hostages, for everyone who is suffering at, at this moment. Um, may soldiers come home soon. May Israel be spared from uh, devastation and from attack. And we pray for uh, peace, for quiet, maybe quiet before peace. In the meantime, everyone, Gemar Chatima Tova, 
Tzomkal, good yantiv, and we'll see you on the next edition of Parsha Talk in the coming. Marachatim Atovah.